Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, one of the things that really held up Brexit uh, was the refusal of the Boris Johnson government to deal with the issue of the Irish border. The EU were very, very clear we needed to keep the open border. Um, the finance or the Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament here and the International Trade Committee have called on the government to ensure that Canada plays a role in protecting the Good Friday Agreement. Canada had a huge role to play in bringing peace to Ireland. We had General de Chastelin was a huge uh, player, Justice Corey, uh, former uh, Minister Warren Almond. I'm asking the Conservatives, are they going to support our call to make sure that as we move forward with trade with the UK, that they, Britain, maintains their obligations under the Good Friday Agreement to keep that Irish border open and to work for peace uh, with, within Ireland. The Honourable Member for Langley, Aldergrove. You know, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague for that uh, important question. Uh, we haven't seen the text of the uh, agreement yet, again, uh, due to delays in uh, getting the negotiations started in a timely fashion when we all knew that Brexit was a reality. Uh, as for the for Ireland, of course, uh, they're they're a good friend of of Canada, uh, member of uh, the international uh, international community, uh, and uh, I would support, uh, of course, the freedoms and prosperity for that uh, for those people. Uh, but uh, I think until we see the text of the uh, agreement. Uh, I would reserve any further comments to, to see how the negotiations there will go. Thank you. Honorable the Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Sorry, Madam Speaker, I didn't hear you. I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for his excellent presentation. I'd like to know if he agrees for parliamentarians and representatives of provinces to be more involved in the next round of negotiations for the free trade agreements with any country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Langley Eldergrove. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, very important question. I appreciate uh, hearing from that member. Uh, of course, uh, international trade uh, comes under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Uh, but that said, uh, for negotiations to be successful and for there to be broad acceptance uh, of any international agreement or treaty, there needs to be broad consultation with provinces, with stakeholders, with unions, everybody that might be involved uh, and who might be affected by that agreement. So yes, I would say the broader the consultations, the better. Uh, and uh, we, we're looking to the government to ensure that there is that broad consultation so that there is broad buy-in into uh, the final text of the agreement. Thank you. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Queen's Privy Council. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and it's always a pleasure to be able to address the, the House of Commons the, on, the, on the floor or virtual. Um, and, you know, I want to pick up on something that the member kind of responded to in one of his answers. He said that uh, the free trade is not a strong suit of this party or this government. And I think the member needs to get a real strong reality check here. And I would challenge that member to indicate another prime minister that has signed off on more trade agreements with countries than the current prime minister that we have today. This prime minister and government has entered and signed off on more agreements than Stephen Harper did and any other prime minister from what I uh, can recall, uh, Madam Speaker. So, you know, it's interesting when I listen to members of the Conservative Party talk about the importance of trade and to try to give that false impression uh, that they are the, the party that negotiates and is capable of getting uh, trade agreements. 
when history doesn't necessarily reflect that. You see, the Liberal Party has always recognized the reality of the important issue of international trade. Trade matters. It means good, solid, middle-class jobs for Canadians. And we will continue to look at ways in which we can build that relationship amongst uh, Canada and other countries around the world in order to uh, continue to strengthen uh, Canada's uh, economy and our middle class. That is what it's been about since virtually day one back in 2015 when we took government, where we saw uh, initiatives that might have been started uh, by the conservative uh, government, but were picked up and carried on past the goal line. And it's all been about trying to recognize how important and valuable we need to have policies directed at Canada's middle class and those aspiring to be a part of it. And you could take a look at whether it's budget actions, legislative actions, or agreements such as the debate that we're having today uh, on, uh, on C-18. The reality is, is that the government in recognizing trade, and when we talk about trade, you know, I, I like to try to put it in a way in which uh, most people could, could relate to it. One of the industries in the province of Manitoba that I'm very, very, very proud of, and I think it's symbolic and it embodies so many things as to why it's important uh, that as a government we pursue uh, international trade, is Manitoba's pork industry. Manitoba's pork industry would not be what it is today by a long shot. You know, if I was to guess, I would say 90% of it would disappear if we didn't have trade, whether it was within Canada or internationally. Manitoba is a population of 1.3 million people. You know, we have at any point in time double the number of hogs in our province. We're not consuming them. Those hogs are up for trade. We sell we sell them. If you ever go to communities like Neep, uh, Nipawa in uh, Manitoba, rural Manitoba, that community is thriving today in good part because of the hog industry. And if you go to High Life and you check with where High Life is and why it's viable, why it's a healthy growing company today, it's because of exports, international exports. Over 90, I believe it's 95%, but it will just say 90% of what's uh, being processed there is in fact being exported out of Canada. Now think of the ramifications of that. Each one of those employees, and there's hundreds of them working out of Nipah now, they require a place to live, a place to do their uh, grocery shopping, they have vehicles, all those indirect spin-off jobs, not to mention the hundreds of jobs that are there today because of that. But that's just one aspect of the pork industry in the province of Manitoba. You could go to Burns and uh, Brandon. And my colleague from uh, Arthur uh, Verdon or from Brandon uh, would be able to talk to you about how that plant adds so much value to Brandon's economy and society as, as a whole. That industry there processes, and again, now this is somewhat dated, you're talking about thousands of hogs every day. One number I heard was over 10,000. Again, well over a thousand jobs. These are these are good rural Manitoba jobs. You can go to the city of Winnipeg, same industry. I think Burns there employs over fifteen hundred jobs. Best pork in the world comes from the province of Manitoba, I would argue. Madam Speaker, think in terms of the farming communities and the impact that it that has for our farmers not to mention uh, the others that feed into 
uh, our farms to be able to have those uh, hogs uh, being produced, uh, Madam Speaker. So when you think of trade, you could quickly understand the value of that trade when you look and isolate and take an example of an industry. I just finished talking glowingly about hog industry. I could go on forever talking about Manitoba's bus manufacturing industry or other manufacturing uh, industries. Six minutes each, and the first uh, set of questions goes to Mr. Chung for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Um, I'd like to uh, focus first on Mr. Uh, Juan Guaido. Um, as you know, um, to this point, uh, many different countries around the world recognized him as interim president. Uh, the European Union, I understand, no longer will recognize him as interim president. Um, however, the Biden administration reportedly um, will recognize him as interim president. What is the government of Canada's position on his status? Thank you very much for the question. Um, first, it's important to, uh, to go back in time just a little bit um, uh, to the end of the legitimate term of Nicolas Maduro. As I mentioned, he was legitimately elected in 2013 and his term ended um, at the end of 2018 in January of 2019. Um, the elections that he had advanced and held in 2018 were seen by the democratic forces in Venezuela and the international community as not being free and fair. And therefore, when his legitimate term ended, um, the Venezuelan constitution dictated that the interim president should be the president or the speaker of the National Assembly. That was Juan Guaido, and that began in 2019. If we go forward to December of last year, um, uh, illegitimate National Assembly elections were, were held uh, by the Maduro regime, not recognized by Canada and the majority of the international community. And following that event, the um, legitimate National Assembly, um, led by Juan Guaido, uh, passed a resolution saying that their mandate, because there had not been legitimate elections, their mandate would continue. And they have uh, taken the form of what's called a, a delegated committee. Um, and Juan Guaido continues as the interim president. It is our view that uh, Juan Guaido is the legitimate uh, interim president of Venezuela okay. and Canada has recognized Thank him you. as such. Thank you. I, um, uh, the second question I have is, um, we have a new US administration. Um, how is American policy going to change with respect to Venezuela? Um, what do you know about uh, what's going on? Thank you. Yeah, it's early days. Um, uh, I think myself and others, we watched with interest the uh, confirmation hearing of Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and um, he did reference in there, and there have been some references of administration officials sense uh, indicating clearly that the United States will continue to recognize Juan Guaido as the interim president. I think moving forward, um, it is essential that the international community, especially those like-minded with Canada and the United States is definitely in that category, that we work together to try and inject some new momentum. Um, I think it's early days from the United States. I think they're gonna wanna hear from their allies. And, uh, and the message from Canada will be that we are prepared to do even more working with them and working with others. Um, and from uh, that's as much as we have at this point from the US administration. Okay, I have two quick questions. Um, one relates to the one Guaido again, Mr. Guaido, and, and the second um, is different. The first, the first question is how long do you think um, Canada can continue to rec recognize Mr. Guaido as the interim president uh, without having a legitimate um, election for the National Assembly? Are we talking years, um, five years, 10 years? Um, I don't need an exact uh, time frame, but what's your sense of how much longer that can continue? And then I have a quick follow-up question. It's a very good question. And the way I would answer is to say that we have taken very good note in, in following the Venezuelan constitution, as, had, as has 
the, the legitimate National Assembly. The motion that they passed extended their mandate for one year. Uh, so until early okay. January of 2022. 20, uh, okay. um, and so from our perspective, we recognize his authority um, based on that until that time frame. Okay. Last question is broader. I had the, as a broader question, you know, many, some people suggested that the reason why Maduro continues to cling to power is because he's got no other option um, and that there has to be an out for him in order to get him out of power and to have a new um, head of government um, put in place. Um, what uh, do you see as the path forward uh, for him um, in order to, if, if that assumption is correct? Um, I think it's important to preface this with uh, a, a, a firm policy of Canada, and that is the, the resolution to the crisis in Venezuela is for Venezuelans to determine. Yeah. Um, yes, we have opinions and, and we, we believe it should be done peacefully. We oppose uh, any, any talk of um, uh, the use of military force. Um, and so, uh, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chong, I, I missed the essence of your question. If you could repeat it very quickly. Well, some people are saying that there has to be a, a clear uh, path yeah. for him out of power uh, in order for us, in, for, in order for Venezuelans to, to, you know, arrive at a new head of government. Yeah. Um, and I, until I, there's a mm -hmm. path laid out, um, he's going to cling to power to the last second. I, I don't dispute that assertion. He has certainly indicated that he has no intention of leaving. And I come back to it's it's up to Venezuelans to determine the way forward. And I think if we can get to the point of real negotiations, legitimate negotiations that are supported by the international community and involve the key parties, I think they will find a way forward. And I wouldn't be surprised if if some creative measures were put on the table, including uh, the future of Mr. Maduro. Thank Mr. Grant, you. thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Uh, the next uh, round goes to Ms. Sahoda for six minutes again, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, kind of the opposite uh, in terms of the countries uh, like Canada and the U.S. that are recognizing um, Guaido as interim president, uh, the countries that have been known to support uh, the Madero government have been China, Russia, and Cuba. Um, in which ways do these countries support uh, Madero? Can you give a little bit more of an explanation as to why their support is important and how, how they're supporting his government? Definitely. Um, I would say it's a mix of, of economic relations and definitely China and Russia both have significant investments in trade significantly with, uh, with um, uh, Venezuela. Uh, the same goes for Cuba. They have a long-standing history of economic relations, which includes um, transfers of heavily subsidized, if not free, uh, oil. Um, but also, it's geostrategic. And I, I don't think it's a great surprise that uh, certainly Russia and, to an extent, China um, see their relationship with Venezuela as a geostrategic lever um, uh, in the world.